My guest today is Tim Banks. Tim, how are you? I'm doing great, David. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I, I want to talk to you because I really enjoyed your keynote presentation at the Juneteenth conference a couple of weeks ago here in Chicago. Yeah, it was that was such a great conference. And, and I like because it had been something that had started virtually. Right. Uh, and so this is the first time we could get folks together. And, uh, you know, Chicago was a wonderful place. The, the Microsoft offices where we had it were, were fantastic. And it was just such a great vibe for for what we were talking about, you know. And um, I liked it because because I mentioned it during the talk. It's that that this is a conference that's not about tech per se. It's about the people in tech. And, right. and I feel like we lose sight of that so easily, you know, because we're very syntax and semantics and metrics and things like that. And we're nerds. We are. And and everything we do is collaborative. But even so doing, we lose sight of uh, we lose sight of people so easily. Yeah, and I think it, this specific conference, Juneteenth, uh, be, you know, because of the nature of it, wasn't just about people in tech. It was about people of color in tech, I think, was the yeah. the target audience. Uh, absolutely, which, absolutely. Like Ninety percent of the folks there um, were black people, and 100 percent of the speakers, I think. And yeah. some of the some of the talks were about technology. Yeah, there was one on blogging and one on chat GPT, and, and, but mm -hmm. some of them were just about career growth, personal growth. Uh, what was yours about? So my, my talk, it was called Solace of You, uh, named after a song by Living Color. And it was about taking back the um, taking back the responsibility for validation and finding value and worth uh, to yourself. And uh, one of the things that happens is as we get in our careers and we start kind of figuring out what success looks like, you know, quote unquote, um, is that we start looking at validation and worth uh, in places that don't come from within us. We do it in our jobs, we do it in our salaries, we do it in like reviews for teams, we do it in awards and things like that. Um, and while that's all well and good, we don't control those things, right? Um, so I'm really talking about ownership of of our of our sense of value and our sense of worth you know re repatriating that which we abdicated away to others um and it's so hard right especially yeah. for black people in our society it is it is incredibly hard because we are we are um judged and and stereotyped and profiled and and all these expectations about who we should be what we should sound like what we should look like what things interest us are our, our projected on us by forces are set out of control. Um, so to push back against all that, in addition to pushing back against the pressures of work and and parenthood and relationships, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's a lot. And we, we often lose sight of the importance of it. Yeah, I often, uh, I, I used to fall into that trap a lot. You know, I, I identified with the job that I did. Somebody said, tell me about yourself. I would start with, oh, this is what I do for a living. And, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I I I realized that wasn't really a part of my identity. That I didn't need to get emotionally involved in the company and the job itself. You know that it's just a job. It's important. I mean, it pays the bills, and I enjoy what I do. But it's not really a core of who I am. Yeah, there's this discourse that goes around social media um, every so often, and and it's going around again now. Someone brought it up. It's like, you know, uh, and it's it's seems mostly within developers. I don't really see it within other aspects or facets of, of the tech industry. But they'll say, you know, um, you know, you can't be a really good developer if developers developing isn't a passion slash lifestyle. Uh, and there's this notion that you know if you want to be a good or successful developer you have to do it all the time like your life has to revolve around that and um i think there's i think there's something to be said about enjoying doing development and programming stuff like that that's great right but you have to be able to do something you have to have something else like we we are not built to stare at a screen for our entire lives right this yeah. is a this is a recent development for for humanity and it's not something that our our bodies and our minds take too well, right? You have to do things 
away from this, you know, from this screen blasting light waves in our face all the time. And you got to go out, you know, the, the joke is go outside and touch grass, but you really need to do that in some way, shape right. or form, or you need to go out and build, build uh, connections and relationships offline. Right. Um, those are essential for us. Totally agree. Uh, that's probably, the, that's become harder uh, the last three years, you know, as those countries gone through this pandemic and we seem to be coming out of it, but we're not there yet. We aren't, and and a lot of folks, me included, you know, I established a lot of you know, you know, digital connections, friendships when we were kind of uh, bound in our homes, right? And some other ones, some other ones that you know I had kept going, you know, kind of fell off. But you know, we still need to find that connection, even if it's connection to our pets, connections to our neighbors, just connections to outside. Like we need to, we need to, um, to kind of put up barriers and boundaries around that. And one of the things I talked about, uh, that was echoed by our, also our closing keynote speaker, uh, was that, you know, you have to have barriers around work. Right. And, and the, you know, just just because you're not working on a work project when you're working on, you know, an open source project or something like that, it's still something we're talking about toward your career. Yeah. Right. Uh, and we have to be more than that. We have to have more than that. Um, and, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be, you know, I do jujitsu. I'm a Brazilian jujitsu uh, um, brown belt. I've got that's, that's a pretty so, fun hobby. It sounds yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah. I've got several, you know, along with with several, you know, international medals. I also have cauliflower ears. So, you know, it's it's a give <laughs> and take. Um, but but that's that's what it was for me. And I've had some other hobbies, you know, and right. you know, cycling and stuff like that. But this is the one that really stuck for me. I've got friends who are um, developers who do knitting or cross stitching. Others do like aerial and pole. And, you know, whether it's something that's very, you know, whole body inclusive and physical, whether it's art expressive kind of stuff, whether it's music, whether it's something else, you have to have some way to manifest your creativity other than typing on a screen all the time. Yeah, I totally relate to that. I'm trying, uh, I try to make a point every single day, get outside, ride my bike. Um, I'm an uh, avid photographer, get out and get some pictures and um, yeah. get out and read a book, just sit in a coffee shop and read a book, a uh, fiction book, yeah. things like that. Uh, get away yeah, from it's, the tech. It's, it's so refreshing. And, and so to, to, to kind of bring it back to what I was talking about yeah. specifically within Juneteenth conference, that it's so important for black people in this country to do that because we have so many things that are already taking away from what I like to call our, our you know, our available emotional capacity, you know? Yeah. Wh why yeah. is it harder for black people than it is for white people in this country? So, I mean, you, we, we have the same concerns usually when it comes to our jobs, right? If we work similar jobs in our roles, we're going to have a lot of the same concerns, right? We may also have additional concerns at work based on biases and stereotypes, whether it, folks are, you know, uh, you know, being basically not inclusive, you know, or exclusive in their language and stuff like that. That's going to weigh down on us in a way that doesn't on you, because if someone's constantly dismissive to you uh, based on, you know, whatever indelible quality there is about it, whether it's race, gender expression, religion, anything like that, that's something that's going to take away from your emotional capacity to be invested and connected at work, no matter what, right? Um, and, and take outside of work, you know, we have issues, whether, you know, societal issues that are, whether the institutional racism, uh, whether they are predisposition to, to diseases, uh, you know, uh, lack of access to health care, lack of generational wealth, um, you know, loss of, uh, uh, of, of, you know, opportunities when it comes to like getting mortgages and things like that. Like all these things weigh on our mind that a lot of folks in this country, so the more privilege you have, the fewer things you're going to have to worry about like that. Right. You know, the, the level of, of, um, the level of, of, or look, the number of concerns you have and how deeply you're concerned about them are different for you when they these issues affect you whether they, as, as opposed to affecting someone else, right? So we walk in the door to work, you know, or when we open up our laptop, we already have those things taking away from our available capacity. And then now you look at taking away any other available capacity by having to deal with stuff at work, you know, related to, to race or bias, something like that. And then with that already diminished capacity, now you have to go and be measured across 
your other peers who do no, do not have these things that diminish capacity from their from their ability to to work. Um, and okay. those those things are compounding. That, that totally makes sense to me. I, I have um, I can I'm related to something in my life is uh, every once in a while I have severe back pain, and it'll last for sometimes months, and it's really hard to focus on work or even anything else during the when I have that. Or uh, if I'm having trouble with my personal relationships, it's hard to leave that behind and compartmentalize that and come as is, give my best effort at, at work because I have this other thing that's kind of ticking over a slice of my brain. And I think um, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that as an African-American, there, there's a part of your brain that's always focused on that. You always yeah. have to deal with that. It's not a temporary back pain. It's not a temporary argument with a with a girlfriend or whatever. It's a, it's a constant, right? right? It is, that, it is that a constant thing. That helps me to yeah. relate to my life. Thank you. Yeah. And so what, what I think is interesting about that, too, is that I'm also, you know, I've got I've got the various uh, uh, letters of, of neurodivergency, ADHD, of uh, anxiety, RSD, and um, uh, major depressive disorder, right? Um, so these things also, th these things also take away uh, from my available capacity um, because, you know, you know, you look at like anxiety and ADHD as just, you know, neurodivergency, they're, they're a condition that I'm always going to deal with, right? Thanks. Major depressive order is a disease. It will kill me if I do not treat it in management, right? And so when... Uh, that depression is starting to assert itself, right? My capacity is reduced, right? And I think those are the things that I think a lot of folks can relate to, right? Because, you know, uh, the, you know those levels of those types of neurodivergency, you know, stretch across, you know, racial and ethnic divides for sure. Um, but what doesn't scale is how they're viewed even within those own communities, right? Um, or how it's viewed even within, you know, gender expressions and things like that. Like, you know, you know, the, one of the kind of, uh, social mores that get enforced that men aren't really supposed to be emotional, right. Or they're not supposed to, you know, levels of toxic masculinity, you're not supposed to cry, et cetera, et cetera. I confess um, I used to buy into that crap. I, I did too. Right. And that does a lot of psychic damage to us for sure. Um, but it also doesn't allow us to release these things and they manifest themselves elsewhere, right? Um, but when you have those issues, if you have uh, problems that are giving you, you know, great emotions that you have to release, like if you're like, I can't cry, I can't cry, right? What are you going to walk? You're going to walk into work and now you've got that thing morphing from sadness or confusion, you know, or grief into what ends up in being frustration and anger and resentment, right? Um, now that's what you're going to walk into work with, right? Um, we don't do good. We don't do uh, very well at, at being able to be around folks who aren't happy. Sure. You know, it makes us uh, uncomfortable. It does, and so when folks have that expectation, even when they're not feeling it, it makes it more difficult. Um, so, but when you relate to that again, we're talking about for for black folks, it's it's we always have those other conditions and then we have the expectation of like, I'm sad or frustrated or angry um, about something. And how do I, how do I express that in a way that's not going to um, damage relationships and connections that I have for sure. Right. But, but I think also it's like, do we just give folks space to do that? Um, and, and it's not just giving, like I, as, as me as being, you know, senior in the industry for this one, I mean, I've been in here 26 plus years. I can say, look, man, I need the day off. My depression's kicking my butt. And I just, I just really can't deal or I've had this other thing go on. And I just, it's just not in it today. Right. I can do that. Right. But if you're someone who's been in this, this career two, three years, right. Um, are you going to be able to re really be able to advocate for yourself like that? Especially if you're a, a, come from a marginalized identity, um, and do you feel safe or comfortable too? And That's so good question. Oh. as, as, as folks with both privilege in society and privilege within a company, like we need to model that behavior. We also need to make sure we are giving space for other folks to deal with those things too. And not, you know, we have to be aware that folks may not feel safe or comfortable to say, Hey, I need this help or I need this space. And we need to let them know that boundaries are okay. So that's one of the calls to action here is if you're somebody with some privilege, like uh, like with experience in the industry, to normalize this thing that's saying it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say it's okay to not be okay. 
you yeah. acknowledge that. Yeah. And and to and to say like even if you don't know what you need, right, which is okay, right? Because I don't always know what it is I need. To say like, hey, you know, what can we do to help? Right. What do you need? You, you need some time. You need we can move some deadlines on this. I can shift some things around and make it like I said, make it OK. Right. Because obviously you can do that. But what's the what's the fallout? Right. Um, and this shouldn't be something that damages somebody's career. This shouldn't be something that that gets their work viewed, you know, poorly because they have these things. Right. Your ability, your ability to work is one thing, but you are a human with human problems and human, you know, uh, uh, conditions that you need to deal with. Right. That shouldn't be, you know, that really shouldn't be uh, 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 problematic for management. You know, yeah, um, it shouldn't be, uh, but it, it often is. What's, do you have any advice for people that are maybe new in their career that don't have that kind of, they haven't established that credibility and don't feel comfortable saying, I'm not, I don't have it today? Yeah. You really got to, first of all, talk to a mentor, right? You really got to talk to find somebody who has that privilege within the org, uh, you know, who has a voice and who has a platform and be like, Hey, you know, this is, this is what I'm dealing with. You know, if it's safe and if you can trust them, right. If you're, when you're new in your career, you don't really have the kind of flexibility and leeway to dictate your environment that you're in. Um, so do what you can. And if you can't find somebody outside the company, somebody outside the industry, you know, in the, still within the industry that, that can give you advice or, tell a friend over there too right um you know the the your 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 group chat slash back channel network is powerful um so go savage one right um go to networking events right talk to people about this like that and and that's another thing that i think we can do a call to action too is to have spaces within the industry for folks who are you know we've got we've got things for for women in tech we need more we have things for people of color in tech and we need more we're starting to get more things for people who are neurodivergent uh, uh in tech but having these communities where people can go especially when they're new right to build and develop a network of folks that experienced similar things so they can go to them for advice for ad you know for advocacy or whatever i think is super important and encouraging those things both within your group as employee resource groups and, and encouraging and participating in them outside of those like birds of feather at conferences or meetup groups and things like that um giving giving space for for those kinds of groups to exist and then as a as a person more junior career uh taking advantage of those things that do exist. Uh, we talked about a couple things here. We talked about some personal stuff, like uh, mental health issues that might get in the way. Uh, and we've talked about some societal things, like institutional racism. Are, are, do you think the societal stuff is getting better over the past 23 years? Um, it's whack-a-mole, right? Some mean? things have some things <laughs> have gotten better. Some things have popped their heads up again uh, okay. in a different place. Some things are worse. Um, yeah, some things are worse, right? And you know the so like, you know may, maybe maybe race relations are a little bit better, okay? But you know maybe the climate towards LGBTQ folks is a w little bit worse, right? And if you are a person who's circles more than one of those marginalized identities, just because one's better and one's worse, you know where where are you at on that, right? Um, right. You have different different areas of concern. Um, so so I, it's it's hard. I will say that it's your ability to be more yourself in the workplace, in tech at least, has gotten better over 23 years. It's gotten a lot better, right? That's good. Um, and, and you know, you can walk in here with a beard and dyed hair and tattoos and, you know, stuff like that, piercings, uh, and still get a job. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I think in and, your keynote you said you used yeah. to have to dress like a white military guy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> tucked in, tucked in, tucked in, uh, collared shirt with, uh, with you know, you know, khakis and short hair and stuff like that. And it was really based on like, it, it, and that was even new in the '90s because it was had only been a few years before where IBM and EDS and the other big tech companies allowed you to stop wearing uh, jackets and suits to yeah. work. Right, they just allowed women to start wearing pants. I don't think I could have thrived in that environment. <laughs> No, it was it was a completely different environment. And so I was I was coming in the industry as that was starting to change. The reason that changed is because the you know the um the dot coms had started to to um steal people away, right? Steal yeah. some of the, the uh and so uh the older companies wanted to show relevance. Um so it has changed that way as far as work. Um 
but it's also like sometimes it's a little bit worse, whether, you know, you talk about insurance, whether, you know, mental health care is covered, whether, you know, uh, gender affirming care is covered, uh, you know, things like that. You know, what med- what meds are covered for you? What meds aren't covered for you? Uh, um, you know, do you have do you have a non-traditional partnership or or marriage, something like that, that that now you have to try and fight to get coverage for and things like that. So so there are other aspects where it has gotten where it's still difficult or difficult in a different way. But there's a lot of ways it has gotten better. That does not excuse us from how far we still have to go, right? Uh, because if you look in boardrooms and you look at C-level execs, um, you're not seeing a lot of people, right? Uh, of a lot people of white of color. Males there. So you're seeing a lot of white males. You're seeing, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of not seeing a lot of black people, not seeing a lot of uh, Hispanic folks or other, you know, traditionally marginalized identities intact. Um, you're starting to see more women, which is great, but they tend to be white women, right? And to to be fair. There's a certain amount of survivor's bias. There's a lot of folks of color. There's a lot of women, a lot of LGBTQ folks who left the industry because earlier on because it was toxic. And so they were not in it long enough to get these tenure positions. Sure. That all said, you've got CEOs and startups and stuff like that who are in their 30s and 40s. And that's right in my age, right? Oh, oh you know, even older millennials. Um, but are the people of color and the marginalized identities, are they getting access to the same types of funds that businesses are getting? Are they getting access to the same type of social networks that folks are getting to get jobs that can move them up the ladder? Uh, you know, are they, are they quote unquote underperforming, you know, white men who do not have to, who already have X, you know, lots of capacity to spare when they walk in the door. Right. Uh, that that, you know, not being they're being compared like, oh, well, they don't do this job the same way or or the job that they do. Right. Which ends up being a lot of more relation building and connection building and and um, doing things that aren't that don't have metrics, but it really exhibit leadership and relationship building. Um, you know, are they really being looked at for all, all that they do? Um, and And I feel like. For the more that you have, you know, white dudes who are doing the interviews and looking for these positions, they're not going to take those things into consideration because they never had to do them themselves. Right. That stuff was always just done. I get um, one of the things that resonated with me from your talk is you said, if someone hands you a microphone, take it. If if someone gives you a platform, take it. And that resonated with me because I I think I check all the privilege boxes of white males, just straight Christian raised in an upper middle class neighborhood. Uh, you know, and so I I don't apologize for that. I mean, that's that's those are the cards I was dealt. Yeah. And I'm using them to the best of my advantage. But at the same time, I want to be sensitive. I want to I want to use my privilege and advocate properly. But t- talk a little about that, what, what you meant by that. So I think when, you know, a lot of times we don't get seen and we don't get heard. Right. In in the industries, we it's, it's there's not really even a good way to recognize folks for, for their efforts in general. Right. So you, people who get seen and heard people that get, you know, they get the keynote speeches, they get, you know, the panels, they get, you know, the, the articles and stuff like that. Um, and when you are given the opportunity to speak in front of people, when you are given the opportunity to, to really express yourself, show off what you know, show off what you, what you've learned, show off your experience, you have to take it. Right. I mean, you know, obviously you don't have to, but you really, the reason that, that it's important that you take it is so that more people see you. I didn't ever see anybody, anybody who, who was black in leadership in tech when I was coming up. Right. Okay. Um, and it matters. Right. That that representation matters. And it's a matter for people to see folks like you in there doing the thing because then you think you have a future. Right. Um, but when you get that thing, you take it. And the other thing is, is that you don't give it up. Right. If you do keynotes, if you if you have done a keynote speak, you are now a keynote speaker. Right. That's what you put on your speaker bio. That's what you put on your resume or whatever. Right. Uh, you know, if you are a podcast host you are a podcast host right you put that on the thing you take that platform and then you let others step onto it right you lift others up onto it but you don't ever give it up you don't ever give it up god so that's interesting you so when you said that your your message was really to the black folks in the audience you were saying hey we need more representation give an mm-hmm. opportunity step up a bit more but here i am in the audience and i took it personally i, I said you yeah. know what i need to do that as well so your message spread more broadly than you intended, I think. 
Yeah. And that's that's the thing about g- giving the mic away. That's like when they say lending privilege, literally, that's what they're talking about is handing someone the mic. Right. Uh, okay. Like I said, like I said, when you walked in, you had the mic when you walked in. I think I said that's like when you walked in the room, when you were born, when you walked in the industry, you yeah. already had the mic. Society gave you the mic. Right. It is your job to hand that mic off. That's what I'm doing today. Like I'm handing this yeah. mic to yeah. you because and, 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 and you seem to be coming out of your shell a little bit. And I, I very much appreciate this opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, that is good. Uh, uh, this is I often lead with this question, but I deliberately did not with you. <laughs> what do you do for a living? <laughs> oh, for a living, I am a lead developer advocate uh, with Dell Technologies. Okay. Um, so uh, these keynote things, that's really a big part of what you do. Get in front of people, talk about stuff. Yeah, it's funny too because I rarely, like I can talk about tech, but I usually don't talk about tech. I talk about people. I talk about tech how it relates to people. I talk about engineering practices and things like that as human systems, right? Um, because you know when when you get people working together well, usually pr- everything else works itself out. Yeah, you know, you know we're, we're, we we people focus on metrics and people focus on some arbitrary result. Right, and it's, they really kind of miss the behaviors, right? Right. If you if you if people are incentivized to have the right behaviors or maintain the right behaviors, maintain cohesion, communication, and interoperation, good things happen, man. Right. That's how we got to the moon, <laughs> you know. Um, but but if folks are siloed off, if folks are they're trying to get the highest number on a dashboard, right? Versus trying to actually embody the behaviors that you need for success, right? You're always going to be going the wrong direction. It'll look real good on paper, yeah. Right? But now you've got It'll a be group like, of people uh, trying to game the system and exactly, metrics, exactly. as opposed to accomplishing something. It'll it'll look like an investor call. <laughs> uh, is there anything we haven't covered that you feel is really important? The one thing I think is really important that we haven't covered yet is, is I really think you know part of self advocacy is is getting help where you need it and not just at work. Like I firmly believe that mental health care and therapy and things like that should be something that uh, we as Black people give to ourselves. <laughs> uh, you know, um, we need it. There's a lot of stuff that we don't deal with, a lot of things that we have to break. Even if you're relatively mentally healthy, like you still want to be able to understand these things so you can help others deal with it or you can uh, understand when these things come up, where they come from, right? Um, and and there's, you know, like I said, we we typically in, in, our, in the black communities, like we don't really brook a lot of talk about mental health. Like you know, we don't really typically deal with a lot of stuff about trauma. We're not the best at dealing with uh, LGBTQ folks, right? Um, but but those are all parts of our culture and, and history all throughout, the, all throughout you know, our, our presence here in this country, right? Um, and so it's time we stop undoing a lot of the generational trauma that we put on ourselves by really investing in our mental health uh, and and trying to break some of those cycles. Excellent. Tim, we're just about out of time, but I really appreciate you spending some time with us. Thank you. It was my pleasure. My pleasure, David. I think it's really interesting when we talk about technology and, and how it relates in our industry. And uh, we have a thing we discovered during the the pandemic was that uh, talks aren't great, but hallway tracks are. It's great to talk with your friends, and I think we should do that more.